All right, all right, settle down, you loud rabble. It's a new chair this week. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's an absolute genuine pleasure to introduce Professor Alan McConnell to the school today for a number of reasons, not just because it's a Scotsman talking about public policy. There's another one? Yeah, this is it. This is, this is, this is it. You've got the full compliment. But also because Alan is, is uh, an excellent researcher and a good uh, friend. He is the Associate Dean of Research of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at the University of Sydney. He's the former head of the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Sydney. As you would expect from somebody that's held those positions, he has a long and distinguished research track record. Uh, too many A-star articles to mention here. A Harrison Prize with one Andrew Heinmoor uh, relating to research uh, connected with the global financial crisis. I think someone else won a Harrison Prize either the year before or the year after that as well. Lots and lots of books. Two most recent ones in terms of contribution are Alan's work on policy success, very well cited and uh, field defining text. And he's worked with Paul Tahar on post-crisis learning and investigation. For all of these reasons, it's a pleasure to introduce him. But the real reason that it's a real pleasure for me to introduce Alan is because he used to be my lecturer a long time ago uh, in a different place, in a different time, in a different weather system. <laughs> Alan was not only my lecturer, but my honours dissertation supervisor. And he was the person that encouraged me to become an academic, so you have him to blame, <laughs> I'm afraid. He was also the person who gave me my first uh, job in academia as a research assistant, and it's not an exaggeration to say his advice and support genuinely changed my life, so it's real genuine pleasure to introduce him. The title of his paper is Hidden Policy Agendas, Shining a Light on the Dark Side of the Moon. Thanks very much, Alistair. That's really, really kind of you. It's really nice to be here. Hospitality has been, been fantastic. And uh, I was at the Royal Oak Hotel last night, and then Alistair brought me Guinness. A of Guinness is, is, is good. So, but I think the hospitality has been taken too far because I, I saw this and it, it kind of looks like a taser. <laughs> so, if I, so if I kind of go off message or something like that, uh, I'm sure Alistair will... That's the five-minute warning. That's the five-minute warning. That's not a bad idea. That's, yeah. That's not, yeah, you could, you could, you could run a pilot study. <laughs> so thanks very much. So I'm here just to speak about uh, uh, hidden agendas. So just a bit about my background. I, you know, it's that Alistair already said something. So, so my interest is in public policy, which is really about, you know, governments and, and what they do. And kind of over the years, I didn't kind of quite realise why I kind of research some things and not others. And then I kind of realised that the, the common thread was that I thought that a, it was the gap between po po the kind of rhetoric of politicians and what they promised and the kind of reality. So everything I've done is kind of more or less, even without thinking about it, is, 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 is about that. I, and kind of because of that, I, I've, I've started to focus on kind of non, what you, you might call non-standard aspects of, of, of public policy, not because they're obscure, because, I, you know, I, as much as anyone, I like some of the main theories, you know, punctuated equilibrium, path dependency, you know, uh, advocacy coalitions, I think they've all got something like, you know, that, that, that's great. But I also, also kind of think that at times there's stuff that goes on in the world that we just look public policies, a discipline doesn't really have a kind of handle on. So I've, I've started to, to think about some... Uh, started to think about some topics that we can try be as a kind of starter, really to think about, about where public policy hasn't gone. So I, I turned to this topic of hidden agendas, and uh, whether we might call a hidden agenda real, or even that people just allege it. I mean, it, look, it's out there, you know, you know, everywhere. You know, Donald Trump's uh, hidden agenda of setting up the electoral 
commissioning to voter fraud is just really to prove that he won more of the popular you know, vote than Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, pre-election giveaways to constituencies and all, and all that sort of thing. Uh, and of course, potentially all that is, is kind of highly damaging because we, in theory, we, you know, we elect our, our politicians to deliver on what they promise, whereas if they kind of drive us underneath that are, 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 are different. Uh, that, that's an issue. So, so really, the, the, for me, in fact, Brian and I had a talking about this just before, my kind of interest is trying to think about uh, uh, drivers of public policy below the formal one, it's a bit in the sense of ulterior motive. So it's not about kind of the grander roles that, that government and institutions would, would, would perform in society. So it's not, even though they're important, so it's not about, say, Marxism reproducing capitalist relations or kind of feminist, feminist institutionalism and it's reproducing gender biases. So all that's very interesting. So it's, it's just not about that. It's not to devalue it. It's just to say that my interest is, is in these kind of drivers that, and I'll speak about it a bit more, almost can't be spoken about because they probably wouldn't even pass the, the public interest test. And that will that hopefully become a bit more apparent as the... As the I was going to say as the years go on. I, I, think, I think the taser will be operated. You've not got that many more years left. Before that, yeah. Thank, thanks for that. Uh, so, I couldn't find a when I approached this topic, couldn't find a single article in Hidden Agendas, and I know people might go and Google, and I'd be very happy. You can find ones with Hidden Agenda in the title, and but often it's just a kind of passing reference, you know, Angela Merkel's hidden agenda on this and that. It's all kind of passing, but in terms of it as, as a kind of concept or theories or kind of serious examination, I, I couldn't find anything. So the goal really in this kind of presentation is really as a heuristic. So it's really a kind of first step as a means of trying to think about it. It's not the last one by any means. It's just a, as a kind of a starter pack really to get hopefully to get out you know, as all to kind of think about you know hidden agendas and you know it's going to involve kind of further further work and so on so it's really a first step not a not not kind of last step since i accepted the the, the a very nice chance to come here. The paper's actually been published a slightly different title in journal of european public policy about two weeks ago roughly i so Anyway, so what I'll speak about, I think I should have been moving this. Yeah, you want to go in the right one. Yeah. All right, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Don't use the taser. Just <laughs> <laughs> so the structure of those, I'll speak about uh, kind of the literature and, and it, it's tackled hidden agendas kind of indirectly. Uh, I'll look in detail at hidden agendas, things like trying to define it, who hides, what do they hide, you know, what tools and techniques are used to hide uh, consequences of agendas that remain hidden, what happens once they're exposed. Deal with some methodological issues. Can you actually prove that a hidden agenda exists? Mm -hmm. Do a small case and then just some issues for the, to think about for the, the future. So, uh, get this right. So, I, I don't want to, I mean, especially to the public policy people, a lot of this literature will be familiar. So, I don't, I don't want to take spend too much on it it's just for me it was just a i was really trying to kind of get a little map there really of of, of a you know of good bits and pieces that things that are written about that might be of value in thinking about it so there's the whole agenda setting you know backrack and barracks cob and all that you know that that, that sort of stuff and again i wouldn't re re repeat it but a lot of that looks at for me the way in which formal agendas can be reinforced because that's kind of quite interesting because if you focus on the formal it's a kind of slate of hand you know to distract you away from the, the hidden there's literature on political parties especially you know I'm sure people study it here, uh, and there's all this there's this kind of underlying competition. Our parties driven by votes need to get you know need to uh, seek office. Are they driven by their kind of ideology? Are they driven by grassroots? Are they driven by you know the need to to get members and so on? And uh, you know. And there's a literature, a small literature on vote buying as well. Uh, and I guess the main thing for me is often, in terms of parties, is despite what they might say, rhetorically outwards, 
they, there can be a difference between their formally articulated goals and their kind of actual goals. Uh, policy studies, literature, uh, kind of broad chucks really, there's stuff to do with risks and trade-offs and just the idea of kind of multiple goals. There's placebo policies which I've written a, you know, a little bit about and I'll, and I'll come back to men, men, mentioning that. But that, that's just useful for saying you know, policy is never simple. There's a whole series of trade-offs and and things kind of further up the pecking order, really, than, than others. There's literature on psychology, you know, including political psychology, but a lot of the more kind of individual-based one is that that a you know you know what's not often visible that we're driven by our emotions or fear and anger, a, a, and so on. And again, I, I guess the kind of lesson from that is the simple lesson is that there, there can be a, a kind of dissonance between you know, what politicians and policy makers say is the driving force and what the actual driving force is. Uh, there's conspiracy theories, you, know, you see them everywhere, you know, from Sandy Hook massacre to, you know, 9-11. Nine, nine and uh, there's, a, there's actually, a, a, you know, there's actually a kind of small, serious literature on that. And that was actually quite useful because it, it, it started to make me think that a uh, often decision decision makers behind closed doors, you might call it con conspiring, uh, but it's a, it's a fairly normal part, <laughs> you know, of how things are governed. And, and later on I'll kind of speak about how I don't think all hidden agendas are necessarily bad. Um, and then there's a literature on failure and fiascos and blunders and, and so on. And uh, now that's quite good because if you think of a hidden agenda as something broadly undesirable or something, something's went wrong, that literature is good in, in different ways of how society copes and frames what went wrong, who do you blame, you know, what happens next, and, and, you know, and so on. Uh, so I kind of took a lot of these and started to think a bit, uh, a bit more about how we start to think about hidden agenda. So that, that's the definition I've got there, hidden agenda, a goal of policy makers which is not publicly articulated but which helps shape public policy. So for me, Behind that is the uh, that there's there's a kind of hidden driver in some ways, not necessarily totally. But there's there can be hidden drivers behind policies that wouldn't pass the public interest test, even though the you know what's the what's in the public interest is a kind of very fluid and kind of malleable and so on. But it it's a you know like if you took an example of corruption, you wouldn't have a minister saying. Well, I'm just, you know, I'm just approving planning for permission for X because it helps me gain, you know, fifty thousand dollars in my back pocket. Really, uh, so there's variations of that. So it's it's almost the is the policy driver that even in part kind of that dare not speak its, you know, its name. Uh, so it's a small room, so it's quite hopefully it's not great. So I'll, I'll just speak around. So this is my kind of way of just slicing up and, and starting to think about, uh, yeah, it's on behind as well. Uh, so just speak a bit, a bit. I, I won't go through every aspect and, and, and speak to them exactly, but it's just to give a sense of some of the, the you know, thinking here. So the issue of who pursues hidden agendas, well, you know, public policy is about you know, what, what can the governments do or, you know, don't do. So potentially you could have policymakers, officials, you know, others involved in public policies could, could, could uh, pursue a hidden agenda. What is hidden? Uh, well, you can have hidden personal goals. I said that it might be a, the, you know, might be kind of corrupt, uh, you know, personal goals, but it, it might be like, semi-legitimate. You know, sometimes ministers do things to make their mark. In other words, this is their big initiative. You know, they can't say that, but that's a uh, you know that you know that's a factor there. Uh, so that kind of you know career progression could be could be part of that. Uh, another thing that's hidden is the pursuit of party goals. And as I kind of mentioned before, what parties say is driving a particular initiative. Underneath that, there may be other things. They're trying to you know do anything from kind of cultivate their, par their party's kind of political capital. They can't necessarily say that, 
but that might be one aspect of the, the driver. Of course, there might be they might be announcing an initiative just to divide political opponents, things like that. In other words, that's the main driver, even though they can't actually can't actually say that. Uh, hidden policy goals. Uh, the the uh, yeah, it, it's kind of about <coughs> seeking policy goals that are not can't be publicly articulated. You know, so sometimes policymakers will do something knowing that it's paving in their mind that it's going to pave the way for a longer term reform, maybe even a more controversial one. But they can't actually all, always always say that. And again, and a big one for me, sometimes a big I think a big goal of, of policymakers is often what I would call a, a, a placebo policy. A, the, the big value of that policy is to just manage an issue down off the, the agenda. You know, it's a field good issue like, like shark attacks. <laughs> you know, something like that. It's, the bigger problem is the public perceptions, really, probably, rather than the sharks. I mean, that, 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 you know, that's an extreme you know, example. But often, the, so... Uh, you know, ministers and others will say, oh, there's a problem, it's in the news, there's an inquiry, there's a report. Yeah, 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 we'll, we're, we're, we've set up this little unit to examine it, or we're, we've set up an inquiry, or we're going to, yeah, we've got a task force that's going to, you know, all that thing has a placebo value, and one value is that kind of agenda management issues, and it's hidden, they can't say, I don't want to, you know, we're trying to manage the issue down. And uh, they might not necessarily succeed, but that, you know, that's a value. Uh, institutional goals, uh, you know, often departments, agencies, etc. They do stuff, uh, and behind what they're saying, what's in their, their their kind of agency reports and their public reports is is things like they're trying to often not always, but they can be trying to protect their own institutional interests, they can be trying to, to pitch for a new funding settlement, they can be trying to send a signal out to the minister, uh, they can be positioning against maybe other some rival organisations mm -hmm. in, the, in the same policy sphere. Uh, and then finally there can be the pursuit of ideological kind of cultural goal, goals, uh, maybe a government trying to do something but it might, can't necessarily admit it because it might be seen as racist, discriminatory or or, or, or something like that. Uh, there's the the issue of who did they hide it from, and, and that was quite interesting coming, especially from the conspiracy theory. So, if we if we think of one way of identifying policy advisory systems, it's just look like how close people are to the action, really. So you, you know, one way of doing that, say, well, there's an inner circle of policymakers and advisors. There's an outer circle. You know, outside government of say think tanks, NGOs, stakeholders, and you know maybe even a kind of broader outer outer circle of, of the media and citizens and so on. Uh, and I suppose you could slice that up in different ways, but one way to think about it is to start thinking about agendas being hidden from some of these players and actors and not others. Uh, and I say that it's quite possible to conceive of hidden agendas being a you know, a, a, a daily, a routine part of policy making. Like, you almost kind of can't <laughs> make policy and all the agonising and all the wondering and, and kind of milling over what might work. You can't have that out there uh, or different possibilities. You just can't have that out there in the public arena, especially in you know, social media that people will kind of latch onto it very quickly and destroy it. So, you know, part of the business of gov governing is having aspects of agendas hidden from these these outer circles. Uh, then moving on to the issue of what, what tools and, and kind of techniques are used to hide. Well, I said one really important one is keeping that focus on the formal policy agenda as a kind of distraction from the the, the hidden aspect. Uh, and that's the, the whole Bachrach and Barat stuff about you know formal rules and procedures, being able to kind of mobilise and filter stuff. Stuff out the, the the system. I mean, a good one. There's a great book. I think it was his PhD, Thomas Kitts, on on presidential commissions in the, in the US, and he, and he looked at Pearl, uh, Pearl Harbor and 9/11 and, uh, and other things. And he basically said they kind of underneath it all, the hidden agenda was to limit the damage to the president. Couldn't actually say that, but that's the way that they actually 
they kind of actually operated. Another way is to kind of insulate the formal ag a agenda from or hidden agendas from scrutiny. I, so you can say, well, you know, the cloak of national security can be used to 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 kind of help mask that kind of subterranean you know, possibilities. You can deny freedom of information requests, things like that. Another way uh, is to attack messengers who say there's a hidden agenda. You know, in Trump's case, it's the shoot the messenger, it's fake news. Uh, and then another one is just to kind of lie. Mm -hmm. uh, and far be it for me to say, but, you know, I, I, I think, uh, yeah. Donald Trump's already attracted a lot of attention. There's, there's videos saying one thing and saying, no, he didn't say that. And then, it's, well, that's fake news. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, there, you know, there are various kind of tools and techniques used to keep the focus on the formal and deny kind of access to the informal uh, and the hidden. Move to the next column. What are the consequences of hidden agendas that, that, that remain hidden? I, well, I won't speak too much about that, but, but not always, and I'll come back to it, but mostly they're kind of kind of destructive or in a normative sense. So sometimes you might have a you know, you've had policy decisions and coalitions built that wouldn't have happened otherwise if the hidden agenda uh, had been, uh, you know, articulated. There was a, not in the article, there was a, a, a famous example in the UK in the 1980s. Uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of Dame Shirley Porter, and she was the leader of, of Westminster Council, and uh, they targeted eight boroughs to sell off council houses uh, for commercial use so it was all articulated in the, mm -hmm. on the basis of kind of value for money and you know, public value and so on but uh, it was discovered eventually that the hidden agenda was that and it was, she was unfortunate enough that she was caught uh, the hidden agenda was to target uh, eight marginal seats in a clearing out of potential Labour voters she was fined millions uh, you know, for that. So it's, that's a kind of extreme example, but it's the kind of thing that the, the coalitions have been built and processes marshaled that wouldn't have happened any, you know, uh, anyway. And again, you know, it's in the article. There's a kind of distortion of maybe even to some degree of program aims and outcomes and, uh, you know, and so on. Uh, so it, it, it's... It's always difficult to know what would have happened otherwise, but if hidden agendas are a driver, probably something different would have happened if the hidden agendas hadn't uh, existed. I, I'll just... Where are we? Yeah, there's pros. What evidence to be used to help demonstrate the existence of hidden agendas? I'll come back to this shortly, but you know, anything from freedom of information requests to biographies, whistleblowing... Wikileaks, etc. But I'll come back to the methodological issues. Uh, last issue: What happens when hidden agendas are, are exposed? So that, that that's a that's a, a, a kind of where the, a lot of the failure literature comes in. There's a really good article by uh, Annika Brandstrom and Sanika Kuipers. That's my Scottish pronunciation. It's probably <laughs> totally wrong. Uh, uh, on different ways that failure can be framed, and there's a book by Bovins and Tart and Understanding Policy Fiascos that's really, really good. Uh, and it's almost a kind of, for me, kind of go to pieces when you want to think the different kind of narrative battles that emerge after something bad happens. So, one of them is a so if you think of a hidden agenda as something not right, a, even in a general sense, you have these narrative battles, and one is over. Like sudden art is well, who are actually, who or what actually caused that to happen, you know? And you know, there's in the literature of failure, there's, there's lots of complex reasons why things fail, but often people will latch onto certain things. So, uh, you know, you, you could have a very kind of agency, individual focus when there's a failure. So you blame the person, you blame them for pursuing. Uh, you know, in the case of corruption, you just blame the bad, the you know, the bad apple. But if you look at it, potentially you can go other ways. You could say, well, was it a flawed 
it, you know, it was there kind of flawed institutional checks and balances that didn't notice or help cultivate that hidden uh, agenda? Uh, or could it be like systemic? In other words, could the reason for the hidden agenda being a, a, a systemic one? Again, a, an example I didn't mention in the article, but there's, there's, a, there's been a whole literature on the idea of, say, overloaded government and we expect too much of government, and that often comes from the right. Now, so if you were of the right and you thought, well, there's too many expectations in government and if government produ produces all these placebo policies, in other words, token policies just to manage off the, dish, the issues down there off the agenda, that's a kind of, the hidden agendas are a coping me mechanism to, to uh, you know, to cope with the kind of broader, kind of dysfunctional system of, you know, of government. So in any failure, there's all there's more than this. You know, you could blame technology, you could blame the individual, all, you know, all these things. But it's a, you know, it, it's quite complex. Another kind of sub narrative of what are the motivations, uh, you know, uh, often it might be self interest. It might be you say, well, a party or a politician is self interested. It's just before an election, and they're they're kind of making promises that they can't fulfil, or they're doling out money that they you know they can't do. But in theory, it's possible to maybe to conceive of a kind of good, kind of good intentions, a kind of noble line, you know, a, you know or maybe hiding behind a kind of na a, a kind of a, a very disturbing national security, a, a, you know, issue in order to avoid avoid kind of raising kind of public fears, a, and kind of related to this all this as well, a, is so I want to speak about them always like how. How, how big is the problem? So in a sense, almost like the lowest level for you have a hidden agenda is to say, well, it's just the individual, so we get rid of the individual, and you know we're okay. But the biggest is to say that it's actually hidden agenda is actually like shared societal issues. So it's a bit back to the example of Trump and the, the Voter Fraud Commission. They, do, you, do we basically say if that hidden agenda exists, is that a Trump problem? And if we get rid of Trump, we're, we're fixed. Well, people would be quite happy for that. Uh, or do we say it's actually a, a kind of societal problem because there's actually there's the system that enabled you know Trump to come to power. So there's a there's a kind of collective responsibility uh, for that. So I do have ten minutes just quickly. So methodological issues. So these are really kind of tough issues. About, you know, so how do you, how do you research something that doesn't exist? It's a bit or it's not tangible, I, and uh, someone mentioned when they presented this elsewhere, they said it's like, it's astronomers trying to research black holes, they, they can't actually mm -hmm. demonstrate that they're there, but they just kind of look around it, and they, they, they kind of infer from all these other forces that the black hole is there, so I, I, kind, of quite, I kind of quite like that in some ways. I, there's the issue of, you know, it's, they're always deniable, you know, like, so, you know, actually demonstrating Unequivocally, in a, unequivocally, don't use the taser. Uh, the that they exist is still kind of troublesome, and I, and, I, and I don't think we necessarily need to go down the kind of hypothesis route or yes or no. I think you know, politics and policies about kind of trying to understand and build kind of plausible cases. So I thought, okay, well, can I try go down the and and think about a way of thinking. About hidden agendas as as a thinking of a, a plausible case, so people will always deny it. But given the, the fact that no one's written about this, I thought I would <laughs> I thought I would make a make a start. So I've got four questions that that are up there really, and I, I would say if you can answer yes, there's a kind of you know fairly plausible case that a hidden agenda might exist it's not absolute people will disagree and so on but it's it's a kind of starter and i think the way to think about this for me is like the Volgovsky book and the art and craft of policy analysis uh, so that you you're never going to do it in a scientific way different people dif you know think about different things but but it's to be kind of creative uh, and inventive uh, rather than treat it as an absolute science so uh, so, you know, the first one really, is there a credible source saying that a hidden agenda exists? And again, you know, if it's a, 
you know, political parties are always saying about their opponents, so oh, the government's real motive here is that, so we hear it all the time, we can probably usually deny that. But if it maybe comes from a credible insider source, someone who worked there, they're maybe more liable to treat it seriously. Is there credible evidence? I, and again, so if, if you think like whistleblowers, WikiLeaks, Edward Snowden and so on, even though, though a lot of people may criticise the actual doing of it, there's not many people that have actually criticised the evidence as well. So I would say that's the, the second aspect. The next one, are there kind of outcomes that, that match the claim that there is a hidden agenda? So the example I give in the book, just a hypothetical one, if a minister was accused of taking bribes, you know, in order to approve planning for permission, I don't know, for a casino or something to be built on site A over sites B, C and D, and uh, it could be proven, you know, maybe subsequently through inquiries or whatever, that sites B, C and D were actually better value for money than the one that's chosen. Well, that's a kind of credible outcome that, that matches the claim. And then, so that's a kind of process of triangulation. And I think the last one is to think about counter-narratives and, and think is, well, uh, is that counter-narrative less credible? And so if you can, if you can say, Yes to the first three, and then four to the yes to the fourth one, having ex subjected the counter narrative to the same pro processes. There is a kind of reasonably plausible case. People will also di always disagree, but again, this kind of heuristic aspect of what I'm trying to do is just a way of thinking about something that you know, no one's uh, thought about uh, bef before. Uh, so the yeah, so. Did a little case uh, on this in in, in, uh, in New South Wales, where, where I took these tests, and you know, in the paper, and it's a case of corruption, and, and I kind of described it as kind of low hanging fruit because there's lots of evidence really to do it. But given this, the fact that no one's done it, uh, and I get good good comments from reviewers saying you basically need to demonstrate it, show it to a case. I'm not saying every case is as easy as this. Where there's plenty of legal evidence, but it's a it's a kind of start. So. Uh, yeah, so I won't say much in de detail. There's a, there's a you know, resources minister rather than going, in New South Wales, rather than going through a process of compul uh, competitive tendering to award a mining licence. Uh, uh, he awarded it without even his department knowing to a friend of his. Uh, and so there's an extensive inquiry, and, uh, and it was by, so it hit all the sense. So it was ICAC, the Independent Commission against. You know, corruption that did it. It was credible evidence, well documented outcomes that matched it. You know, ICAX basically said there's no other explanation for this other than what to benefit his mate, and his mate also had links which helped him uh, in, in electoral terms. And is there a counter narrative less cre credible? Even yes, because even his defence, it was more on technical issues. It said, yeah, well, it would have taken too long to go out to competitive tender. There was issues around about being a kind of training mine, and these technicalities didn't stand up at all. So it's a, I said, it's an easy case to do, but it, for me, it's just a start. The, the tricky issues and the more difficult cases. Uh, so, just to finish on uh, some things to think about. So the, I've described this as a kind of starter for thinking, given that, that there's not a single article. I thought obviously it'd be quite nice for. for if, if some people pick this up in terms of case studies, a big issue is kind of exploring this kind of zone between, you know, the kind of proper type kind of issues of kind of falsifiability and just kind of plausibility. Uh, I think a really interesting thing for me is what I would call the normative dimensions. Now we tend to think, <coughs> I did certainly at the start, I thought, well, hidden agendas are bad because they go against the principles of democracy, and I think you know, that, that, that's true to a, a large extent. But I think a uh, hidden agendas actually often perform a function, you know, in government. Uh, they're a routine part of governing because government couldn't function if it didn't manage lots of issues down and off the, you know, off the agenda. If all its kind of dirty linen was out there, in the, you know, in public all the time, or if ministers just espoused, you know, I'm just doing this to benefit my career because I need a big landmark, you know, policy reform. Uh, so I think uh, hidden agendas are more normal and more functional uh, in some ways than we might think. And, and again, how do we differentiate between them? Because, you know, would we say that taking money in a brown envelope 
you know, to do X is worse than basically doing something to promote your career, we probably would say, you know, we probably would say that. But how do we start to think about all these grey grey areas? I uh, thinking about the causes of hidden agendas. I uh, and I've mentioned here. I don't know. If, I'm sure Alistair definitely will be uh, interested in uh, will know this and, and, and kind of Brian as well. That uh, there's a literature, there's a a, a, a book uh, by Charles Perrow called Normal Accidents, and he kind of argued that well, societies are so kind of complex and intertwined and control of huge amounts of energy and resources that every now and again you're going to have accidents and failure and catastrophes. Like it's, it's a kind of normal part of governing. So I'm um, kind of almost thinking, are hidden agendas inevitable? Is it something we just need to, to kind of put up with and accept? Uh, there's another aspect. Uh, hidden agendas is a supplement to comparative agendas project. So that, as many people know, the comparative agendas project from Baumgartner and others uh, is all about kind of coding debates and legislators and so on and it's kind of not particularly my way forward but it's a perfectly legitimate way and, and I, I don't see this as competing with it I mean that's much more about formal policy agendas and, and, and uh, our discussions and in, 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 in legislators and so on and you know that, that you know that's fine what I'm trying to do is I would say it's something hopefully complementary in the sense that it's more kind of getting beneath it to start to think about the subterranean and that's why I would say, you know, it's a bit shining a light on the dark side. Uh, I think the title of the, the presentation was The Dark Side of the Moon, so it's a Pink Floyd. <coughs> Pink Floyd uh, uh, illusion there. Uh, you know, we know it exists, but we, we kind of don't really know, you know, very, very much. It. So this kind of paper is, is about trying to think about the, I would call that kind of dark, in the sense of dark side of the moon, and dark side of public policy, even though the paper's just published, I do, I'm going to continue with a lot of the ideas in different ways, so I'm, I'd be really happy to hear any comments and suggestions or, or anything really. Thank you. <laughs> Time, time, the clock's exactly it. The taser's going away. <laughs> <laughs> Don't need it. You have to invite me back. <laughs> <laughs>